<laughs> you think that's funny, don't you? <laughs> All right, welcome back to Family Bible Time. We are in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 24, and then 1 Chronicles uh, 21 and 22, and Psalm 30. And I've just been told, don't forget the Psalm this time. <laughs> Yeah, it is like that. Um, so, 2 Samuel, which I won't find in the Psalms, 2 Samuel 22, 24. 2 Samuel 24. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray for your mercy and your blessing, please, upon our time now. Please speak to us, Lord. We realize that we need the work of your Holy Spirit and... We don't want to grieve you. We don't want to, Lord, cause you to work against us in any way um, to discipline us, Lord. We, we pray that you would please forgive us all our sins and, and be pleased to bless us. Please work in us to, to live lives that are pleasing to you, that we might, might walk blamelessly before you today, uh, that we might honour you in all that we do and in, in all our labour for you. We pray for your blessing. So please teach us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. David's census. The, this is a sad episode. Um, we're going to have it twice, both in 2 Samuel and then in, in 1 Chronicles. And it's, uh, it's a painful time to realise how that's your phone. Um, to realise just how the the Lord was um, really going to discipline the people and discipline David for his um, pride and his attitude and and the sin the sins of God's people again, especially the sins of leaders, have these terrible consequences. And we're going to see this play out in David's life. So um, I'm going to have a sip of coffee and we'll get started. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he incited David against them, saying, Go, number Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and number the people, that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, May the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while, while the eyes of my lord the king still see it. But why does my lord the king delight in this thing? And this is... Interesting, because now Joab, who's been sticking around David all these years, I don't think Joab's a believer um, by the way he behaves elsewhere, but Joab is now more in, has more insight into the, what's right and what's wrong than, than David does. Um, but the, the king's word prevailed against Joab and the commanders of the army. Um, someone uh, commented the other day uh, that they liked the way you were able to, to to tell me that I'd got it wrong. And um, I chuckled because when I read that, I thought, well, I'm I'm asking. I actually ask Karis. In fact, Karis, I've told you, you get a prize, don't I? But I don't think I've ever given you a prize. But there's a there's a prize for there's a prize for proving me wrong. <laughs> Um, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Yes, but the, look, if you're a leader and you the people around you can't tell you when you're getting things wrong, you are in big trouble. I want my wife, who knows me better than anyone, and I want my daughter, who quickly sees through any mistakes that I make. I want them to tell me, right? I mean, if you, if you don't want to be told that you're getting something wrong, mm. there is a big problem. 
in this case, Joab and the commanders of the army are saying no to David and David's pressing ahead. And you have to say at that point, that is bad leadership. That is foolishness and stubbornness. And Joab and the commanders of the army went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. Why was it? Why, why is numbering the people of Israel such a bad thing? I mean, there was a census. Do you remember? Remember the book of Numbers? God commanded there to be a census. So why is there a problem here? Actually, this is to do with David's pride, isn't it? Um, do you remember me saying before how God commanded the kings of Israel not to accumulate horses and chariots? We're going to see Solomon break that rule, and wives, and David's already kind of broken that wall, but rule, but Solomon's going to show the world just how, how far you can break that rule. Um, why, did, why did God not want Israel? I mean, the chariots and horses, those are like the, the best weapons of the day. Why did God not want Israel to have all the best military equipment? Yes. Because they wanted them to trust in him. Exactly. So they, he wanted, God wanted Israel always to be dependent and to be trusting in him. So why is, why is David counting the army at this point? Even Joab knows that that, that, that doesn't seem right. Well, well there's a lot. That there's, you're going to see there's, there's more than a million people in this whole army. And they know that. They know that they've got a huge army, a, a huge potential army. And it seems then that they, they realize that there's a real problem because it, it's, it's, a, it's a statement of... Um, rely, it's, it's like saying we, we're okay. We don't need God. We've got this huge army. And, well, that's, that's the result of pride. What does the Bible say about what God does to the proud? He opposes the proud, doesn't he? Mm. Yeah. What, does, what, does, what does God hate? Six things the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. What's number one on the list? Haughty eyes. Haughty eyes. A proud look. And that's interesting, isn't it? And, and what's David doing now? David is, is showing the pride that's in his heart. And even Joab and the commanders of the army don't want him to do it, but he's, carried, he's stubborn in his pride. So verse 5, they crossed the Jordan and began from Arur, and from the city that is in the middle of the valley toward Gad, and on to Jazer, and they came to Gilead and to Kadesh and the land of the Hittite, in the land of the Hittites. And they came to Dan, and from Dan they went around to Sidon and came to the fortress of Tyre and all the cities of the Hivites and the Canaanites. And they went out to the Negev of Judah of Bathsheba. So when they'd gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days. And Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to the king. In Israel, there were 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000. Wow. But David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, just as a little note, again, how long did it take? Nine months. It's a little bit like his sin with Bathsheba, isn't it? There's been nine months. There's nine months whilst this has been going on. He could have stopped it at any point, couldn't he? It's like with Bathsheba, he could have confessed his sin at any point but he had to wait until Nathan came and confronted him. Mm. He wouldn't confess. 
And now he, I think this is better because at least he's confessing. Nathan doesn't have to come and confront him. But he's... Yes, go on. So that's what I was just saying, that if if you... It, David was counting the people, but they already knew that they had a lot of people. And when he's counting them, he's kind of saying, oh, look what a strong army we've got. And that's a function of his pride. That's, so that's David kind of being proud of what's happening. It's funny because... Our church has been growing recently. Praise the Lord for what he's been doing, bringing quite a few new people along and the chapel's filling up and the balcony's filling up. And um, I thought the other week, exactly this, I thought well, we should count and see how many people are coming along. And then I thought, no, I don't want to count. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. Okay, Lord, if the Lord is blessing us, that's wonderful. Um I don't want to boast about what's happening. And it's funny, I was speaking to um, Anita, who thought she would count, and then she stopped herself for exactly the same reason. And that's the danger, isn't it? For, because the moment you, you see that, oh, things are growing, we've got more people coming along, let's count, then if you know how deceitful your heart is, you know that you're only that far away from boasting. Mm. And it's scary because you think, well, the Lord is going to, if I get into boasting, if I'm proud, even in my heart, mm. the Lord will discipline me. So that's why, that's why God's people should stay well clear of boasting. Mm. It doesn't mean we should never count how many people come, but... If we're going to count, let's be, be careful how and when we count and not allow ourselves to boast. Um, so, David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I've sinned greatly in what I've done. But now, O oh Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. When David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him, and said to him, Shall three years of famine come to you in, the, in your land? Or... Will you pl flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And there died from the people that there died of the people of Dan to Beersheba seventy thousand men. When the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now, stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I have sinned and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Please, please. Let your hand be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruana the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word, as the Lord commanded. 
And when Aruana looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Aruana went out and paid a homage to the king. And with his face to the ground, Aruana said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David said, To buy the threshing floor from you, in order to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Aruana said to, the, said to David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for, the, for burnt offering and the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Aruana gives to the king. And Aruana said to the king, The Lord your God accept you. But the king said to Aruana, No, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea for the land, and the plague was averted from Israel. All right, now we're into 1 Chronicles chapter 21. And this is fascinating, because now, remember I sent me saying that the, the book of Chronicles is another viewpoint, it's another it's a bit like the different Gospels. This is, this is God inspiring Ezra, the chronicler, probably Ezra anyway, to write another account. And so we get a slightly different perspective. Now look at this, in verse 1. Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. What did it say in 1 Samuel? Mm -hmm. who, inc who incited David? The Lord. the Lord incited David. So was it the Lord or was it Satan? Ah, ah. Now if you, what? What if the Lord told Satan to do it? Exactly. What if the Lord allowed Satan to do it? Mm -hmm. So in the book of Job, we, we see this played out in more detail, don't we? And it's really, really helpful because mm. in the book of Job, Satan's coming before the Lord and Satan's saying to the Lord, you know, um, well, God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him in all the earth, blameless and so on. He fears God, turns away from evil. And then Job says to, uh, Satan rather says to God, does Job serve you for nothing? And Satan accuses Job to God and says, basically, uh, he only serves you because of what he can get. God then says to Satan, all right, he's in your hand. You can take away what he has. So, <laughs> all right, who, who's now afflicting Job? Actually, Job understands. Job doesn't see that it's Satan, but Job understands that it Ultimately, it has to come from God. If we, he says to his wife, shall we, shall we receive good from the Lord and not evil? Well, ultimately, if Satan wants to do something to David, if Satan wants to incite David to number Israel, he has to have permission from God. And so we can say, ultimately, it's God who's responsible, isn't it? God actually can use Satan to do all sorts of things, can't he? He can use Satan to either judge unbelievers or um, in the New Testament we talk about putting someone out of the church as handing them over to Satan for the destruction of the body. God, God can use Satan to discipline believers. And, and that's in, in 1 Corinthians 5. And um, if you want to look that up, it's, to, it's, it's that their, their soul might be saved in the, in, ultimately. So 
God can use Satan in all sorts of ways, but it, it, Satan is, is, is very powerful, but he's still under the control of God. We can't, we, we, we can't separate um, Satan from the sovereignty of God and say that Satan has a free reign. He doesn't have a free reign. So here we are, this is how you reconcile these things, that Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. This is another little bit of insight into what happened behind the scenes. Verse 2, So David and Joab said to Joab and the commanders of the army, Go and number Israel from Beersheba to Dan. Bring me a report that I may know their number. But Joab said, may the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. Are they not, my Lord the king, all of them, my Lord's servants? Why then should my Lord require this? Why should it be a cause of guilt for Israel? This is interesting because we're seeing even more specificity about what Joab said. But the king's word prevailed against Joab. Joab departed and went through throughout all Israel, and came back to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to David. In all, there were 1,100,000 men who drew the sword, and in Judah, 470,000 who drew the sword. But he did not include Levi and Benjamin in their numbering, for the king's command was abhorrent to Joab. Now again... There are some differences in the numbers here in Chronicles to what we see in 2 Samuel. And you say, well, why the difference in numbers? And it's very interesting. If you try to compare them, try to work out, some of it may be copying errors, some of it may be, the, in this case, it, it may be the fact that they're counting certain groups of soldiers, like there's a standing army in um which may be included in the first set of numbers. And both the writer of 2 Samuel and the writer of 1 Chronicles could have been drawing on a larger record with more detail. Both of them could have inclu included some figures and excluded others. And so it doesn't actually mean that there's a, a direct contradiction. Um, very helpful notes, actually, in the MacArthur Study Bible at this point, if you want to look into that. Verse 7, But God was displeased with this thing, and he struck Israel. And David said to God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing. But now please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have acted very foolishly. And the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Choose what you will, either three years of famine or three months of devastation by your foes while the sword of your enemy overtakes you, or else three days of the sword of the Lord, pestilence on the land with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell. And God sent the angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. But as he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw, and he relented from the calamity, and he said to the angel who was working destruction, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And, and, and the, you see, the name is different. Was it Aruana or Ornan? You're right. That's exactly what it is. People can have different names, and um, over time, and in different places, they 
they tend to pronounce the names differently. Um, and so those names can stick in different... So if you, if you have one record, it's the same in the Gospels, isn't it? Is it Matthew or Levi? Oh, actually, Matthew is Levi. Um, is it Simon or Peter? Oh, Simon is Peter. So, so it's interesting, isn't it? So you've got these sometimes two different names for the same person. And David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord. This is verse 16. Standing between earth and heaven. And in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. And David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. And David said to the Lord, Was it not I who gave command to number the people? It is I who have sinned and done great evil, but these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand, O Lord, my God, be against me and against my father's house, but do not let the plague be on your people. All right, just pause there for a moment. This is David now. This is David now being a little bit like our saviour, isn't it? This is David saying, please punish me. What king is there? What king is there who wants to suffer rather than his people? Pretty much any other earthly ruler wants his people to suffer rather than him. <laughs> but David is being a bit like Jesus at this point. Jesus says, let me suffer instead of those people. Let the blame be upon me. This is what you said the other day when we were talking about the gospel. God blamed Jesus. I think that's really helpful, a helpful way of putting it. God blamed his own son instead of blaming us. This is David saying, blame me. Blame me. Yes. He's blame shifting, but in a good way. Very good, yeah. Wow, this is the opposite of what Adam did, isn't it? <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is him saying, let me take the blame. Now, David deserved the blame, but actually Jesus didn't, did he? When Jesus said, blame me, he was, he let the punishment fall upon me. He was perfect, and he was doing that. Now, and, that, and that's our only hope, isn't it? That's what we were talking about yesterday, was just the reality that there's no other way for us to be forgiven. Than, and because we, did, we all deserve our own. We've got things that we're to be blamed for. We deserve to be punished for our sin. But it, we can only be forgiven if God blames Jesus instead. So that's what you have to ask for. If you want to be forgiven, you have to ask and trust that God will blame Jesus instead of you. Now, verse 18. Now the angel of the Lord had commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Orna and the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word, which he had spoken in the name of the Lord. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. He turned and saw the angel, and his four sons who were with him hid themselves. As David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out from the threshing floor and paid homage to David with his face to the ground. And David said to Ornan, Give me the sight of the threshing floor that I may build on it an altar to the Lord. Give it to me at its full price. By the way, the sight of the threshing floor becomes the sight of the temple. We're talking about the Temple Mount. We're talking about Mount Moriah. We're talking about the place where right now there's that mosque and there's that flat area. The flat area is the 
place where the threshing floor of Aruana, or Ornan, the Jebusite, was. And that's where they built the temple later. But right now it's just a threshing floor. Anyway, that the plague may be averted from the people. Verse 23, then Ornan said to David, take it and let my lord the king do what seems good to him. See, I have given oxen, given the oxen for burnt offerings and the threshing sledges for the wood and the wheat for grain offering. I give it all. But David said to Ornan, no, but I will buy it, buy them for the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours, nor offer burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David paid Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the site. David built there. Um, I lost my place. David built there an altar to the Lord and presented burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the Lord. And the Lord answered him with fire from heaven upon the altar of burnt offering. Then the Lord commanded the angel, and he put his sword back into its sheath. At that time, when David saw that the Lord had answered him at the threshing floor of Orn and the Jebusite, he sacrificed there. For the tabernacle of the for the tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses had made in the wilderness, and the altar of burnt offering, were at that time in the high place at Gibeon. But David could not go before it to inquire of the Lord, for he was afraid of the sword of the angel of the Lord. Then David said, Here shall be the house of the Lord God. Here shall be the house of the Lord God, and here the altar of burnt offering for Israel. Verse 2. David commanded to gather together the resident aliens who were in the land of Israel, and he set stone cutters to prepare dressed stones for building the house of God. David also provided great quantities of iron for nails for the doors of the gates and for the for clamps as well as for as well as bronze in quantities beyond weighing and cedar timbers without number for the Sidonians and Tyrians brought great quantities of cedar to David for David said Solomon my son is young and inexperienced and the house that is to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent of fame and glory throughout all lands I will therefore make preparation for it. So David provided materials in great quantity before his death. Then he called for Solomon his son and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, You have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name because you have shed so much blood before me on the earth. Behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest. I will give him rest from all his surrounding enemies for his name shall be Solomon." And I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name. He shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish his royal throne in Israel forever. Now, my son, the Lord be with you, so that you may succeed in building the house of the Lord your God as he has spoken concerning you. Only may the Lord grant you discretion and understanding when he gives you charge over Israel, that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. Then you will prosper if you're careful to observe the statutes and the rules of the Lord that the Lord commanded Moses for Israel. Be strong and courageous. Fear not. Do not be dismayed. With great pains I have provided for the house of the Lord 100,000 talents of gold and a million talents of silver and bronze and iron beyond weighing 
for there is so much of it. Timber and stone too I have provided. To these you must add. You have an abundance of workmen, stone cutters, masons, carpenters, and all kinds of craftsmen without number, skilled in working gold, silver, bronze, and iron. Arise and work. The Lord be with you. David also commanded all the leaders of Israel to help Solomon his son, saying, Is not the Lord your God with you? And has he not given you peace on every side? For he has delivered the inhabitants of the land into my hand, and the land is subdued before the Lord and his people. Now set your mind and heart to seek the Lord your God. Arise and build the sanctuary of the Lord God, so that the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God may be brought into a house built for the name of the Lord. Wow, these are wonderful, wonderful moments, aren't they? And it's kind of scary to me that the Lord said to David, you shall not build my house for you're a man of blood. I, I, I want to be the person whom the Lord would be pleased to use for anything. And yet it is true, isn't it, that there are consequences to our sins which can hamper us from certain kinds of service for God. Let us never, never forget that. um, Can I say a word to those who want to be um, ministers, who want to be used by God in the salvation of souls? Um, we, We need to be extra fearful, do we not? extra fearful of doing anything to displease the God, this God from whom all blessings flow. That's, that we, can't, we cannot do God's work. We cannot build God's kingdom without God's blessing. If we try and we don't have God's blessing, we'll just be doing it for ourselves and for our fame. And that would be terrible. That would be an absolute disaster. So, um, let's remember that in fear. Psalm 30. A psalm of David, a song at the dedication of the temple. You say, but David wasn't around at the dedication of the temple. He wrote this song for it. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from shale. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you, his saints, and give thanks to his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment. And his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Our Father in heaven, we pray your blessing upon this day. We pray that you, O Lord, would teach us to fear your name, teach us to fear to sin against you. O Lord, keep a check on our pride. Don't let us 
override the warnings that others around us would give us. Don't let us get carried away with the the uh, the, the, the pride even in your blessings. Lord, if you bless us, please also keep us humble. Don't allow us to become those who offend you in moments of blessing. Lord, lead us in paths of righteousness, we pray, for your name's sake. We pray for your mercy and your provision and your blessing on your people. Thank you for these examples in your word, Lord. Thank you above all for the Lord Jesus who took the blame and bore the wrath. And so we stand forgiven at the cross. Amen. God bless you. And we will see you, God willing, tomorrow. Till then, bye for now.